Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. I am back from Portugal, and I'll be sharing some of my thoughts, feelings, insights, such as they are about Portugal uh, for our normal Friday cadence later this week. Uh, But today, welcoming Dr. Robert Funk onto the podcast. I already told Dr. Funk what a wonderful name. Um, He's assistant professor of political science at the University of Chile's Faculty of Government, and he's a partner in Andy's Risk Group, a consulting firm. Robert and I didn't know each other. I reached out to him on Twitter after I read a really great piece that he wrote in America's Quarterly, and we'll link to that in the show notes. He's actually since deleted his Twitter, so it was very serendipitous that he answered that we were able to set this up and happy to know Robert now in a conversational way and hoping to invite him on to future podcasts about this. Um, I'm also going to put a link um, in the show notes to a piece that Christopher Hitchens wrote um, in 2002 about the coup in 1973 and about Allende. Um, and I just wanted to to close the intro here um, with with just a, the the ending sentence that only Hitchens could have brought us. I, I miss Hitchens so much. Uh, not that I agreed with everything he said, but I would love to know what he he would make of what's going on in the world. Um, but the last sentence of this article, like some other small or faraway countries in our past, Chile is one of those which, to its glory and its misery, has produced more history than it can consume locally. So here we are. Uh, helping out and consuming some of that history ourselves. Cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. All right, Robert, thank you so much for making the time to talk about um, a country that has long been a favorite of mine. I always love these small countries that are underdogs that have potential and, and never seem to qu- to line it up quite right. And Chile falls into the boat. Thanks for making some time to talk to us. Thanks for the invitation. It's my pleasure. Um, I guess we might start. I, I wish I could say I, I was this brilliant and planned it this way, but this will come out on Monday, which happens to be the 50th anniversary of the coup that deposed Allende. Um, and I, I guess I, ju- I just would start with a relatively sort of simple, a deceivingly simple question, let's say, which is, um, what does it mean that we're 50 years since um, the coup against Allende? How, how do you try and make sense of that in a, in a short, pithy way for, for the audience? Well, you know, I mean, these anniversaries are always opportunities to look back, to take stock. It's almost like New Year's Eve, right? You sort of think about the year that's gone by. In this case, we're thinking about the 50 years that have gone by, and certainly there's been a lot of uh, water under that bridge. Uh, And this is especially true given the last four years uh, that Julie has gone through, which began, I guess, with a with a big explosion or what we call the estadio social, the social explosion, a series of protests in late 2019, uh, which were quite violent, which were quite a shock to the system. Uh, That led to a constitutional process that we're still going through. We had the pandemic, uh, we've had elections, we've had referendi, referendi, I guess is the word, (laughs) referendums. So it's been a very, very uh, hectic and and stressful and difficult four years for Chile. Um, And much of the tensions and problems and discussions that we have gone through in these four years, COVID aside, really originate in the logic and the the problems and the tragedy that was the coup 50 years ago. One of the most you recently wrote an article for America's Quarterly, and we'll link in the in the notes to the podcast. And it was really striking. You you had a graphic that showed shifting attitudes towards the uh, attitudes towards the coup between 2013 and 2023. Um, and you know, 16 percent said the military was right in carrying out the coup in 2013. 36 percent in 2023, and sort of similarly shocking answers along the way. How do you account for the change in public perception over such a short time period? A lot of people interpreted that as a kind of warning sign that Chile was kind of, you know, flirting with authoritarianism. Uh, sort of that Chile, the Chileans were having a kind of romantic or nostalgic. 
uh, yearning for for a kind of new <laughs> Pinochet. I actually don't think that's true. I think uh, those numbers are kind of um, uh, circumstantial to these last four years. As I said, the protests of 2019 were very violent. Uh, there was there was arson. There were there were there were people died. People lost eyes. The police reacted very violently as well. But the protesters were also violent. There were tanks on the street. Um, you know, for someone who, like me who grew up in Canada to 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 hear tanks on the street was was a little bit freaky. So, I think it was a big shock to the system. And one of the conclusions that many Chileans reach was kind of we, we've we've become Latin America again, which is kind of silly because of course Chile has always been Latin America. But in in <laughs> in the public imagination, Chileans were kind of always thought of themselves as more developed, more institutional, you know, a, a country that was more uh, somehow different from the rest of Latin America. Now, even investors, by the way, I would often hear from clients mm -hmm. who would say, you know, our conclusion is that Chile, you know, it's, this is not good. It's not bad. It's just that Chile has become Latin Americanized. So, and then came the constitutional process, which was a, a, an agreement, a cross-party agreement, a way of of getting out of this mess, a way of getting out of the protests and reducing the violence. And that constitutional process produced a constitutional draft, which was really way out there. You know, it was a constitutional draft that I said in an interview, I think it was in, I don't know, The Economist, I don't know where it was quoted, that said this, we were producing the world's first woke constitution. And I don't <laughs> use the word woke in, with a, with a, Kind of, I don't assign value to that. I'm just saying this was a very much, you know, a constitution written by kind of urban, educated, progressive young people. So there's a lot of reference to things like animal rights, right, or things like certainly, you know, women's rights and indigenous rights and sexual diversity and things that are all very important and very valuable, and but certainly quite unusual to see in a constitution, right? So this was very much a 21st century constitution. Um, particularly on the issue of indigenous rights, I think that it went to a degree that scared a lot of Chileans. They, uh, essentially, it gave indigenous groups, which make up, you know, maybe maybe two percent of the population, maybe um, gave them as an essential veto on a lot of political and economic decisions. So it scared a lot of people. And then, together with that, Chile has seen since the pandemic, since the since, you know for some time, increasingly, but especially since 2019. An increase in the influence of drug trafficking, drug trafficking groups, violence, carjackings. So Chileans are feeling very insecure. There are they were subjected to this protest, which really scared people. Um, they uh, were presented with this constitution, which ultimately they rejected in a referendum in last September or two, I guess, a year ago. Um, and so now, if you ask people, sure, they say, you know what, uh, we want mano dura. We want a, a strong hand to deal with crime, to deal with drugs, to deal with, uh, we want stability, we want governability, and then we've gone a little bit too far the other way. I think that's what those numbers refer to much more than, oh, Pinochet was this great president. Yeah. Um, there. I get your point about nostalgia, but we can also say that there's nothing imaginary about the idea that Chile is more developed than the rest of Latin America. Choose any metric you want, education, GDP per capita, annual GDP growth. I mean, Chile has really outshined the region um, over the last 40, 50 years, which is the, the sort of ironic, I, I don't want to call it the silver lining of the coup. I mean, but I mean, Chile really has done better. And one of the things you said in your piece that really resonated with me is that you know, sometimes you get revolutions in countries where things are actually going well, where people have had a taste of something better, but they want even more. And, but, and when you think about it from that point of view, if you're in it in the moment, sure, it feels terrible and it feels like the world is ending and things like that. But it is also maybe a symptom of striving for something better. I'm sure if we go back in time and look at, uh, you know, the writing of the U.S. Constitution or previous constitutions, it's it's an inherently messy process. Um, so it's, it, is there any silver lining or am I being too naive? There? No, I actually agree with you 100% that, you know, a lot of the, and I've written a paper with my former boss, Andres Velasco, who's a former finance minister. We've written a paper where we where we talk about, where we kind of challenge the, the, the dominant narrative, which was that the protests were about inequality and about, you know, how terrible everything was. Well, really... I think the pro we we suggest that the protests were about a collapse in trust in institutions, 
um, uh, 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 frustration, very similar to what we saw in Spain with the Ignaos and you know, in many other countries where where people feel that political parties are not being responsive, where politicians are out of touch. Uh, and in the case of Chile, if you look at what people were demanding on the street, it was better pensions, better education, better health care, um, which is not to say that they didn't, you know, you, you don't see this in Nairobi, right? Where I'm sure that education <laughs> and pensions and health care are a lot worse than they are in Chile. Chile, in fact, is one of the few countries, one of the few countries in the world, including the United States, which is not on this list of countries with universal health care, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Chile, uh, the public health care system in Chile is not great but it is universal. Uh, there are long waiting lists, but there are long waiting lists in Great Britain and in Canada, you know, so, which also have universal health care. So, uh, so I do agree with you that actually, that, that now the problem is, and here's where, here's where I, I maybe uh, not quite disagree with you, but where I kind of move away from the silver lining, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that... Uh, because we convinced ourselves and people and there were political sectors that that when the protest started said you see we've been telling you for a long time that everything was terrible and we, you know we need to change the constitution and somehow we convinced ourselves that the answer to these demands that were being made on the street went through a complete redesign of institutions which has a certain logic if you understand that there was a rejection of institutions, right? Where people were saying the institution is not responsive. But at the end, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you that actually things weren't so bad. And most of the solutions, therefore, that were presented, because the diagnosis was wrong, the solutions that were presented were also wrong. And now we find ourselves mm. in this kind of vicious circle of proposing constitutions that nobody likes and we're now in a second constitutional (laughs) process which we can maybe talk about in a minute but we're in a second constitutional process which is uh needs to tie up its work by the end of the year and everything indicates that they're going to present a constitution that is either as regressive or more regressive and reactionary as the constitution which have now which was which which has its origins in the pinochet dictatorship and it's probably going to be rejected again. All the polls show that Chileans want to reject this constitution too. So we're this kind of groundhog day of saying things are awful. Let's make a new system. The new system is worse and nobody knows how to get out of it. Yeah, the the flip side of that is, you know, Pedro Castillo thought that in Peru and tried to, you know, upend the system. I'm sure Gustavo Petro thinks that in Colombia and tried to upend the system. Uh, right. What AMLO is doing in Mexico and challenging electoral institutions in Mexico is far worse than sort of sure. the process that, that Chile and, is and, going and, through. And, but and, I take and let's wait and see what happens in Argentina. <laughs> I've I've lost all sense of reality in Argentina with uh, with Mila. I don't know how you <laughs> how you bench- we had a we had a guest on from Argentina uh, a couple weeks ago, and even he was completely dumbfounded. So we're in good company there. Um, but to your point, I mean, more than fifty percent of Chileans seem to want to reject this next draft. And Boric, I believe, has said that he's not going to try again during his presidency. So I mean, d- is it a circle? Is it just going to be sort of a a never-ending circle of constitutions? Do we get a third draft that is the mean between the progressive and the regressive? Like, where do you think this goes from here for Chile? It's very hard to say. I mean, I actually think, I, st- I still I still hope, because the way that the second process was designed was that there was a committee of experts that presented a first draft to this constitutional council. The constitutional council is, is dominated by the right and the far right. The, the, but and so they are the ones that are kind of introducing these things, which are quite controversial, like like restricting abortion. They proposed, then they, then they they withdrew this proposal, but they had proposed, for example, eliminating eliminating uh, property tax, constitutionally eliminating property tax. So things that really were are, are quite out there. So I, I but they were they withdrew that, and I sort of cling to the hope that if we if if we end up with a draft that's similar to what the experts proposed. Then, and these experts, by the way, are political experts. They were political appointees. So it's not like there's a total absence of politics here. It's not like a, this wasn't a, um, uh, a techno poll. As, you know, there's an old, old, old term. I think it was Jorge Castaneda who, termed, who coined the term techno poll. This wasn't a completely a techno poll uh, constitution. 
but uh, but it was a fairly well received draft. If if we stick to that, then I ha- I still cling to the hope that maybe we'll get through this. Otherwise, as you say, Boric says he's not going to go through this again. This will be a huge a huge defeat for Boric either way, right? I mean, he, as I like to say, he had one job, right? He was elected in the middle of this process, and for, he belongs to a sector that has been that has been calling for a new constitution for forty years, and We've had two opportunities and we blew it. Um, so, but eventually you're going to have sectors. If we, if nothing happens and if we stick to the existing constitution, we're going to have sectors probably on the left who are going to take to the streets again to say we want a new constitution. So, I don't think this is over. We might have a lull for some time, and then we'll go back to the drawing board and try to do it again. Well, I guess that was one of my questions: whether there was just. You protest fatigue about this entire thing because okay. you can't just continue to go out into the streets, sort of, you know, an, it, infinitely. Usually, at a certain point, protests run out, and once you lose the momentum there, things are not going to push forward. But so, you are you scared of sort of another social explosion in the same way that we had in 2019 if the constitution falls apart? No, you know, I think the I think well, uh, you know, Chile has always had protests, um, and. The, the, we, especially during the winter, right? You have student student protests. We've had protests for sexual diversity, protests for the environment, for you know against development projects, against my against uh, uh, dam uh, building. There's always protests for something. We had a major women's movement in 2018, but 2019 was different, right? I mean, that was that was there was something about 2019 that took off. Uh, and that was especially violent. I don't expect a repeat of that because I think Chileans are exhausted. But I do think we're going to have pressure if this constitution is rejected from sectors who basically it'll be very hard for them to accept uh, that they were so close to so close to the golden ring, right? So close to achieving, um, you know, if you, if you think of sort of the more radical sectors on the left and what was happening in Chile in 2019, you know, many people really thought that the government would fall. They thought that Pineda would resign. They thought that, and then they had this constitutional opportunity where they thought that they were going to design a constitution that 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 was uh, uh, that really limited the, the the power of of certainly the private sector, but in general, sort of handed handed power to. Uh, decentralized power, both geographically and politically, and the, and they lost it. They lost that opportunity. So I think it'll be it'll be very hard for them to accept and just continue as if nothing happened. If if uh, if 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 this present constitution ends up being how it is now, or if it's a, if it's rejected and we go back to what we have presently. Um, for for foreign businesses or foreign investors. Um, or even for Chilean companies, does any d- does this actually matter? Because if it is just an endless circle of constitutions and debate and social froth and things like that, but the rules don't actually get changed. And Chile's, I mean, you know, we might say that faith was lost in the institutions, but the institutions are also doing their job. They are moderating the crazy people on both sides. We are not getting um, a crazy constitution getting passed. Uh, we're not getting uh, people seeking power by extra ju- judicial means. Is this actually just an example of of Chile's institutions doing what they're supposed to do, moderating the more radical voices, and that the business environment will be relatively unaffected? Or do you think that no, all of this constitutional drama is actually a net negative for businesses in Chile? I would actually argue that it was. The, I mean, you're, certainly what you say is true to some degree. The institutions have, or even if you look at the protests, right, the way that Chile found to move away from the streets and away from the violence was an institutional agreement, was a constitutional agreement. That's true. Some would argue that really what what got us away from the violence in the streets was actually COVID, (laughs) that the the protests (laughs) actually kind of fizzled out because, because of COVID, because everybody was locked up in their homes. But, uh, But we did find an institutional solution. That is true. But if you look at what happened after that, institutionally, we designed a wacky proposal. And what ended up really moving us away from that wacky proposal was the people, uh, not the institutions. It was actually voters who said, and and this was, in a way, it was very predictable. And some of us kind of 
you know, I wouldn't have predicted the result necessarily that we got last September 4th, but um, but it was predictable in a way that, you know, Chileans were never as progressive. I remember when Michel Bachelet, just as a parenthesis, I remember when Michel Bachelet was elected in 2005. And there were all these kind of articles appearing in the international media saying, how does a country as conservative as Chile elect its first women president? Uh, you know, Chile has a reputation of being conservative. I have friends who used to visit Chile and used to say, why is everybody dressed in black and brown? You know, everyone's dressed sort of <laughs> so darkly, it's so conservative. Um, you know, the average Chilean is not someone who is, you know, is not the, uh, the, uh, the worried about animal rights, or is not necessarily someone who, you know, there's a there's a there's a kind of a caricature of the kind of person that 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 is uh, that took to the streets or is having these demands. Uh, and 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 President Boric belongs to that group, right? These are young, urban, educated, uh, progressive people. So the character is, I don't know, that the quinoa and that they, you know, all wear the same kinds of glasses and the same kinds of clothes. Well, but most Chileans are not that, right? You go outside of Santiago and you find most Chileans are kind of, you know, lower middle class people who are quite conservative socially, who just want to get through the day, who are very worried about crime, uh, who are very worried about the cost of health care. And if you come to them and say, well, yes, health, the cost of health care is important, but it's also about but we've put a line in the constitution that says that nature has rights, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yes, the institutions do work. And one of the things that Chile has always had, you know, when, the, the, in 1973, when we had the coup, the shock, what, a lot of people said, well, this is very shocking for Chile because it's got a long-standing democracy. Well, the truth is Chile did not have a long-standing democracy. What it did have since almost its inception was strong political institutions, and that differentiated Chile from the rest of Latin America. And it would appear, as you say, that even in the face of everything that we've gone through, we there is still a kind of uh, a, a kind of you know historical legacy of 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 strong institutions, which we hope will continue uh, into the future. But like everywhere else in the world, you know, things change very quickly. Um, institutions are slow to adapt and we live in a world that adapt, that changes very quickly and therefore it, it's very institutions start to look obsolete they start to look like they're not responding so even if they're not necessarily bad or evil they're just slow to adapt to new realities um and so we can continue to have a tradition of strong institutions but if people feel those institutions are not responding to these new new realities you're going to get these kinds of shocks that we've gone through um, I'm going to ask you an impossible question now, but we'll see if if you've got an answer because I haven't figured out a good one yet. Why does Chile have strong institutions when just about every country around it does not? Do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, I mean, again, that's kind of a, a historical legacy, but I, I'm, I'll, I'll answer that question, but then I want to go back to actually what you asked before, which yeah. was why should investors okay. care about this, uh, which I think <laughs> I didn't answer. So Chile has a strong institutional legacy basically because very similar to the United States, you know, the United States, when it was founded, it had the Articles of Confederation and everyone and for, I don't know, what, 10 years or 20 years, they found that didn't work very well because there wasn't a strong enough central government. They went back to the drawing board in 1789 and made a new, or 1787, I guess, and made a new constitution, which worked better up until recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, Chile, when it was founded, also had an institutional arrangement that did not provide enough power to the central government, and and I uh, there was there was a figure named Diego Portales who's kind of a he was never president but he was kind of the power behind the throne, and and he started instituting a very very authoritarian draconian system, but essentially that 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 authoritarianism authoritarianism passed through the idea that the state that you had to have a state you had to have a strong state strong laws enforce those laws. And that basically survived throughout for the next 200 years. And that's something that many other countries simply doesn't have, countries in Latin America w was not instilled in such a strong in such a strong way. And what ended up happening in many of those other countries, what happens when you don't have a strong state, it's often replaced by 
local, either local elites who are running their own little kind of world or corruption, right? So Chile, for the most part, avoided that for a long, long time. Uh, so that's why we've had strong institutions. The um, why should investors care? Your previous question. Mm-hmm. You know, because quite often when we talk about a constitutional process and you know the, these discussions on the design of the political system, you're absolutely right that that investors say, well, you know, why do I care if there's gay marriage or not, or why do I care if we're saving the whales or not? That's not going to affect my copper mine. But in you know in the in the draft of the of the in the first constitutional proposal, you had, for example, changes to the rules on expropriation. You had changes to um, one of the things that was a great concern to many investors was water rights, because of course mining requires a lot of water, and water rights have become a huge issue in Chile in the face of climate change, in the face of entire towns that are drying up because you have mines higher up the higher up the the mountain. That are that are diverting water for their purposes, and then you know downstream you have towns that have to import water because they're drying up. So, so you there are issues if you if you have a constitution that, for example, introduces a whole set of social rights. Well, those social rights, especially if those social rights can be judicialized, which is what a lot of analysts say happened in Colombia and Brazil, then you have a state that now suddenly has a constitutional responsibility to increase spending on healthcare, education, pensions, and so on, to a degree that's not viable in the long term. That affects the the financial, the fiscal health health of of the country. So constitutions do matter for investors. Um, and the good news there is that at least for the time being, it's looking like the kinds of things that are being proposed are probably not going to affect investors' interests too much. If this constitution is rejected, then the, the the interest for investors is, uh, you know, investors will say, "Oh, thank goodness, we dodged a bullet." Well, yes, but the uncertainty continues, and investors don't like uncertainty. No, although no one likes uncertainty. From from my geopolitical perch, I mean, very few countries can sport the fundamental strengths that Chile has. I mean, when we talk about, for instance, energy security, I mean. You know, everybody talks about wind and solar and things like that. Chile is actually the country that can make that work and make it work on a relatively cheap basis. When you talk about being a center for hydrogen economy, Chile is doing it. Talk about being a center of the digital economy. Well, Chile is the one that's spearheading the you know construction of undersea cables to Asia. Um, and this is maybe where we might bring it back to the ghosts of Cold War's past because. I at least think that some of the reason that 73 happened was because Chile was caught between the Soviet Union and the United States and ideologies of global communism. And Allende becomes not just a Chilean symbol, but a symbol for for the global left and part of a much broader story. Um, And I I was always struck where um, in the previous um, White House under President Trump, Pompeo was really trying to push Chile around, trying to say, we don't want you to have any relations with China. We we don't want you to we want you to be firmly in the U.S. camp. And I wonder, do you have any fear that Chile is now getting caught between sort of, you know, the dragon and the eagle that we're just going to do this 2.0 and and we're just going to sort of rerun history that way? Or do you think there's a world in which Chile can actually take advantage of a world where there isn't one dominant power and use some of these fundamental strengths to outperform, even if we do have all this constitutional craziness. I've actually been telling anybody who will listen that that in the medium and long term is the great challenge. Um, <clears throat> because Chile has kind of had it easy for now, right? Chile oh, Since 1990, Chile opened itself up to the world, had signed dozens of free trade agreements, achieved uh, you know, the visa waiver status with the United States. So Chile's kind of, you know, on good terms with everybody, and that's wonderful. But China is certainly making its presence felt um, in terms of its access to rare earth minerals, in terms of its support during the pandemic. As you know, Chile, uh, or Chileans receive the first, I think, two doses of the vaccines were the Sinovac vaccine, um, which was a bet that the government made and actually turned out pretty well because I'm still here. Um, but uh, <laughs> yes, and, and you haven't you haven't turned into a crocodile. I have not. Nothing's happened then. to me yet. And then, but then <laughs> the Chinese uh, announced that they would build a plant, a vaccine plant, in Chile to supply the rest of Latin America. So you see how you know you see how this relationship starts starts to work. 
And for the time being, that that works okay. Chile, Chile continues to trade with the United States and Europe and so on. But you know, it doesn't it doesn't take an awful lot of imagination to imagine a, a, a position. And this is a problem for the United States, perhaps even more so than for Chile. It doesn't take an awful lot of imagination to imagine a moment where, say, hypothetically, Russia invades Ukraine, and say, hypothetically, the United States goes to the UN and says we want to condemn Russia. Uh, you know, it's not that hard to imagine a situation where China tells Latin America, you guys vote with us, we're going to support Russia, not Ukraine, and you guys vote with us, otherwise, you know, we cut off, it's not that we cut off trade, we cut off your energy supply because they're controlling the transmission lines, or they're controlling the ports, or they're controlling, you know, so, you know, Pompeo, you're absolutely right that Pompeo kind of tried to bully Chile around with respect to the issue of Huawei, the purchase of of Huawei projects, products, and so on. Uh, I'm not sure he was entirely wrong. You know, I'm not sure that I don't think that was a way to go about it. But I think the strategic problem for the United States is there, and the real problem there is that you know, of course, the, st the, the strategic problem is is also a uh, systemic problem. If the, if China says we want to. Uh, have more involvement in Latin America, they direct some company and say, okay, build a mine, build a, uh, pur purchase a mine or build a mine or buy lithium or build a battery plant or build a vaccine plant. And essentially it's an organ of the government of the state that they can do it. It's much more difficult and not to say impossible for the United States to tell Elon Musk, build a battery plant next to the lithium supplier in Chile as a way of guaranteeing our access to lithium. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess my the, where uh, where Pompeo I, I think went wrong for me is just that you know he part of his bullying was to say that well China is going to interfere in your internal uh, you know political processes you want to be more aligned with the United States which is not going to interfere with your internal processes at all which is very rich coming from the Secretary of State of a country that did interfere very deeply in Chile's political processes I don't think China was uh, doing anything on either side of Allende uh, in sort of the grand scheme of things um, so there, there's a U.S. tone deafness I think also in the region that you know China by virtue of just being far away in the same way that the United States is a more attractive power to maybe a Vietnam uh, maybe China is a more attractive power to a Chile because it's further away. Uh, at this moment, it's, I'm not sure it's a more attractive partner. I think it's a, if it's a more attractive partner, as I say, it's because China offers more. What's the United States offering? And I've had this conversation with American authorities. You know, what are you offering? Um, American policy towards Latin America, for the most part, is the same policy that it's had since the 1990s, which is free trade and, you know, for some countries, it's immigration or, or drug trafficking, but it's, you know, what are they talking about in terms of military collaboration, cooperation? What are they talking about in terms of, uh, again, access to developing hydrogen and green hydrogen and lithium? And, and uh, how is the United States helping along those lines rather than um, basically criticizing? Because I think what Latin America often hears from the United States, even if there's more there, but but what they're receiving, what they're hearing from their end, is a criticism on immigration, a criticism as criticism on you guys are the ones supplying us with drugs. Uh, and now, of course, inter internally in the United States, we're in a situation where you have one of the major parties talking openly about bombing Mexico um, or invading <laughs> Mexico. So that's what that and that's. That language doesn't stop at Mexico, right? That language, even if no one's talking about invading Chile, there's the sense that the United States is um, that the internal problems of the United States and the dysfunctionality of politics in the United States is such that obviously it's much easier to do business with someone else like China or Europe. Or Iran. Look at what's happening with Bolivia. There's a lot of news coming out now that Bolivia is importing drones from Iran, which is a great worry for Chile, which historically has border issues with Bolivia. Yeah, that that's a good segue to, um, and I feel like often foreign uh, observers, and especially those in English-speaking countries in the West, don't think about um, sort of rivalries within Latin America itself. And Latin America has been relatively sleepy over the past couple of decades. But if you look closely you say it's not so sleepy when you look at what's happening in Bolivia, when you look at tensions between Chile and Argentina, 
Um, I look at Brazil and see a sort of younger version of the United States, uh, right up to Manifest Destiny going to the Pacific, um, although Chile and Brazil have generally had good relations because of the geography between them. Um, the question I'm sort of leading up to is that under Boric, at least, Chile has been sort of lopped into this center-left, leftist group of countries, Mexico, Colombia, um, although, you know, Borges, to his credit, was very, very critical on Venezuela at a recent summit in, in a way that some of his other le- leftists weren't. Um, wh- where does Chile fall from a regional position? Is it a leader? Is it a follower? Do you think that um, it has its own position, no matter whether it's a left or right president? How do you think about Chile's regional role? You know, I've participated in, in several presidential campaigns on the foreign policy side, you know, these little subcommittees of subcommittee of a subcommittee of a committee that looks at foreign policy. <laughs> and on almost every one, at some point, we get into the discussion of, you know, should Chile side look towards the United States? Should Chile look towards Latin America? Should Chile look towards China? And and to me, it's always been kind of a false choice, right? Um, but the, the, the what's behind that discussion, of course, is this very old debate as to whether, we go back to what we said at the beginning, whether Chile actually is part of Latin America or not. And so, you know, the people that say we need to concentrate on our neighbors and Boric is more of this, Boric has this disposition, which is, you know, we're part of Latin America. Our, his first visit was to Argentina. Um, the, the, this kind of romantic vision of, you know, we are of the race, la raza, right? We're, 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 we're we belong to our Latin American brothers and sisters. Uh, geopolitically, of course, that's a little bit naive because really, you know, our our future lies, and I don't want to say China, I'd say our future lies in the Pacific. And I think the Pacific is China, is our Australia, is the United States, is Russia, is Canada. Um, that's probably where the emphasis ought to be. Having said that, as you say, we have have historically had border issues with all our neighbors, with Peru, with Bolivia, with Argentina. Um, and and so, of course, Chile has to watch that there. And, 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 and in recent years, not only that, we start having now the appearance of new resources such as lithium. And lithium doesn't recognize borders, right? Lithium is basically straddles the border between Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Um, green hydrogen straddles the border between Chile and, and Argentina. Even per, they've some they found some petroleum that straddles the border between Chile and Argentina. So there's all sorts of new issues that can arise. The immigration issue has caused all sorts of problems mm-hmm. between Chile and Peru because per, the, Ch- the Chileans say, you know, they're they're coming in through the through through the desert through the border at the desert. Um, and, and then, of course, there's this third dimension that I mentioned earlier, which is there's geopolitical issues that are not necessarily bilateral, but are geopolitical, like the, the appearance of China or Iran or other countries that are trying to influence in the region. And if Chile is not careful, it's suddenly going to find itself very much exposed or in the middle of some sort of geopolitical power struggle. Um, so you think, you know, Ukraine is far away. But uh, what does Ukraine have to do with Chile? Well, if wheat prices go up because of a war in Ukraine, then that, that and of course, we've all gone through this, right? Inflation, to a large degree, is the product of, of, of the war, the product of, of the increase in the price of wheat, the increase in the price of transportation. You know, I'm not sure that in Latin America people are very aware of the fact that even though you know, we're far away from the world, we're very much a part of the world, and and these issues need to be you know they need to be much more engaged in these issues um because they're paying the price for them literally yeah well and i mean in some ways brazil is a much this is much more tangible for brazil for example bolsonaro who was almost rapidly anti-china comes into power and sees well a lot of brazilian trade goes towards china if we're going to piss off china like things are going to be bad for for my supporters so i'm going to have to make nice with china to the the flip side of you know whether it's bolsonaro or lula being nicer towards russia in the invasion of ukraine because brazil depends on fertilizer and if you piss off russia and russia cuts off the supply of fertilizer well suddenly brazil's not you know exporting commodities again and we get into that same circle it's it's not quite as apparent i guess for chile what what do you think are the 
the real sort of um, foreign dependencies that Chile has that it has to worry about from that perspective? Well, I mean, our prime two trading partners are the United States and China. Um, so that's clear. Chile's whole economic model since 1990, since probably before 1990, since since you know the latter part of the dictatorship, but 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 especially since 1990, has been based on trade and based on 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 free trade agreements and selling its products abroad. I mean, the, the Chilean model has been uh, that Chile is a small country, and therefore, if you want to you know grow economically, you have to sell beyond your borders. That also means importing things that you that you you know maximizing uh, yeah. your your uh, <clears throat> competitive advantage, and that means we're not necessarily producing cars. Well, we're not producing cars. Uh, we're going to import cars, or we're going to sell copper, or we're going to import refrigerators, or we're going to sell grapes. Uh, so it's very much in Chile's interest to ensure that we have access to those markets. That probably explains why they are. You know, they try to play it both ways in with, with respect to the China-United States uh, situation. But that that's only going to go so far. At some point, it's clear, if the relationship between China and the United States goes down the path that it seems to be going down, you know, countries like Chile are going to be caught in the middle. They're going to have to opt. And say they opt for China. Say they say, okay, their future's with China. We're going to opt for China. Okay, that's fine. That is likely to have political repercussions down the road as well. And for the reasons that I said earlier, right? Yeah, that Chile is going to lose some independence with respect to its positions internationally. Chile will, you know, opting is not just mean does not just mean opting for market access. It means opting for a particular worldview. And many Chileans will probably feel uncomfortable with that because many Chileans feel much more akin in their worldview to kind of a liberal Western democracy than to a Chinese model. That's that's why someone like Boric, who is left wing, has no problems in criticizing Venezuela and Nicaragua and supporting Ukraine over 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 Russia. But in the long run, that will be much more difficult. Um, and then, I mean, just sort of bringing it back to where we were before. Uh, and I know this is an imperfect analogy, but there'll sort of be two questions. The, f- the first is just sort of. Do you think that was a similar choice with Allende, that the Chileans were choosing a Soviet point of view, or do you think that is trying to graft Cold War ideologies onto something that was really about Chile and not about the Cold War in general? It was really about Chile. I mean, Allende, look, the Soviets, <laughs> the Soviets, first of all, the the, 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 the the communist partner there was never really the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union didn't do anything to support Allende at the, at the end. The communist partner there was, was Fidel. And that was the model. And Allende really had a kind of personal affinity and to some degree a political affinity with Fidel. But even there, Allende always insisted that he was going to go down the democratic path and not 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 copy Fidel in, in terms of his revolution. Um, so, I, so the process in Chile was much more domestic. It had much more to do with domestic political realities, domestic political conditions, poverty, development, etc., um, and the coup, even though this is not, you know, it's not an especially popular position, but the coup was also, for the most part, domestic. Yes, the United States supported opposition groups, funded some opposition newspapers. You had Henry Kissinger saying they were going to make the Chilean economy scream. You had all of that. But at the end of the day, it was domestic elites. It was domestic military that said, you know, and and it was domestic politics that failed. That, that led to the coup that occurred 50 years ago Monday. And last question, because I know you have to run and want to be respectful of your time. Uh, we, we started the conversation talking about those shifting attitudes towards the 1973 coup. So I, and I, this is also an impossible question. Hopefully, we'll both be around in 10 years and we can talk about it again. But in 2033, how do you think uh, Chileans will respond to those questions? Was the military right in carrying out the coup? Is a coup d'etat never justified? W- where do you think we go in 10 years from that? Well, that's a great question because, you know, 10 years ago and 20 years ago, there was much, there appeared to be much more consensus on the coup than there is today in Chile. You know, across the political board, there was much more condemnation. Today we have the right and we have the emergence of a new right wing party, a kind of populist right wing party in the mold of Bolsonaro and Trump, which is Rep- Republicanos. Who are much more strident in their support for the coup and for Pinochet and so on. So there seems to be less, again, as we said at you know at the, at the start, 
because of the conditions, the particular conditions of Chilean politics over the last four years, there seems to be a much more divided attitude towards the coup. So there, that makes it very difficult to imagine where we'll be in 10 years uh, because things can happen. But what I will say is that in many ways, this is the last big anniversary in which many of the of the protagonists are still around, right? The main protagonists, mm -hmm. many of them are friends of mine, are now are people who were ministers in the Allende government or who were opposition leaders in the Allende government are today in their late 70s and early to mid 80s. Uh, and it's unlikely that many of those people will be around 10 years from now. And I think that will also change the tenor of, of the commemorations uh, and the challenge will be such, and the same way it is with the Second World War, with the Holocaust, with other type, these types of anniversaries, to ensure that we do remember, that we do commemorate, that we do repeat the story, that people understand, so we don't lose that, right? That people understand there was torture. People understand that you know that that that, that what this was all about. So I think ten years from now is going to be in, in a way much more challenging even than it is today. <laughs> um, well, on that note, Robert. Uh Tell the listeners where they can find out more about you if, if you want. I'd love to, to plug in any work that you want them to follow. Sure. Yours. Well, I mean, I'm an academic at the University of Chile, and, and uh, I uh, run a consulting firm called Andy's Risk Group, which has a website called andysriskgroup.cl, and and, uh, and I write columns all over the place. So, And I up until yesterday, I had Twitter, uh, but I actually pulled out of Twitter yesterday because I finally had enough of our friend Elon Musk. So you can no longer find me on Twitter. I, I noticed because I was trying to look up our past messages on yep. Twitter and you had disappeared. Sorry and I was like, oh that. my God, did I did I invite a Nigerian prince on the podcast? I'm sorry He's not going to show up or it was, uh, it was a completely different thing. Um, well, look, thank you so much for making the time. And I, I hope you won't mind if we call you back on from time to time for your expertise. It's I really appreciate really it. It's been really fun and looking forward to our next chat. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.